time for us to transition to our worship service. So if everyone can find their if everyone could find their seats, we will get started. We have some members we haven't seen in a while, and we have to greet them. Okay, I think we're just about ready. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a joy it is to be in your house of worship today. And Father, we anticipate a great blessing. And so, Father, we just invite you to come into our midst, and we just pray that our hearts will be right with you today. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's meditate until the service begins. Well, good morning once again. Happy Sabbath to you. I want to welcome you to our worship service and especially our guests who have joined us today. We are so thankful that you've joined among us. We have a number who are on vacation, I know of for sure, so we're missing a few today. But we trust that they are being blessed and maybe they might even be tuning in. So to all of those who have joined us online, we welcome you as well. Let's look at our church appointments as we always do inside our bulletin. Of course, I will not mention those that we have as regular weekly things, but the special ones, let me just point them out. First of all, today, what is happening at 3.30 p.m.? Yeah, we are going hiking, and for those who would like, we will leave from the church at your clock. You can go there directly, or if you would like to follow me, you're welcome to leave here. 
Okay. Also, Monday night for the board members, we just want to make sure you notice that we are having a board meeting Monday night. And next Sabbath, we're going to have our next health lecture. So we would ask that you would prepare or plan for that and join us for that as well. And finally, there is one other item of business that we need to take care of. Remember last week, we had our first reading for the church budget for the new church year. Of course, the church year begins on July 1 and runs until June the 30th of the following year. And so we've had a week to look it over to see your bulletin, ask any questions, and now is the time for us to do a final word. So at this time, I would like to entertain a motion that we accept the church budget as presented. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. We have a second, okay. All in favor, please indicate that we have lifted hand. Amen. Any vote? Okay, thank you very much. That is here. It is now time for our ministry to stop. Yeah. This is a good morning. Good morning. Um, I have these two beautiful ladies up here. I'll get this shirt. Let me get you up. Oh, the shirt I bought. Maybe. There we go. I might move you closer, though. There we go. So these beautiful ladies, we're going to share a little testimony. Some of you, um, I'm sure all of you know them. Uh, this is Brenda Thomas and Donna Pritchard. Pr Pritchett. 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 And they have been doing some Bible studies together. I'm going to give you each a microphone. And I'm going to take this one. Ooh, okay. Is that going to be too much? All right, so I'm going to ask them a couple questions. It's exciting because you know how last uh, time I was up, well, I was up here several times, but uh, last month we talked about the Bible school, and many of you know we have a Bible school going on, and I encouraged you to think about filling out the volunteer card to either be willing to be trained on giving Bible studies or do the Bible study guides yourself. And so I'm going to have them share a little bit of their testimony. So you guys were coworkers. You started working together first at Cato, and then you started, uh, you both switched over at two. I was already there. Oh, you, go I ahead, hold it up. I was already there at Ross's. Oh, you, you were at Ross's. Okay, and you were also working at Cato's. No, nope. I was at Cato's. Oh, okay, tell me the story. So so you were working at Cato's, you were working at Ross, she came in to shop. Go ahead. And right, and Donna came in, and she was telling me, about her job and how much she liked it, and then I should come over there and maybe apply for a job. So she switched over to work at Ross, and then they become co-workers. So tell me a little bit about how you guys ended up uh, doing Bible studies together after you're just co-workers, maybe Donna. Well, I started asking her questions, and then I asked her questions about the questions. <laughs> so she invited me here. Okay, to come to church. Yes, and uh, I uh, was told about those amazing facts, and I started getting them, and after services, I would go over to her house. All right. Well, I know um, you told me that you kind of shared something with her. She had all these questions, right. and you said, well, what did you, what did you tell her? Well, um, I tried to be brief in my explanation of a lot of things. This is new to me as well. I've never done this before, but um, and then I would say, you know, Donna, I'm sure there's we have lessons on this, and we would look and sure enough there would be a lesson on it. And I'd say, you know, maybe we ought to just take it easy and wait until we read the lesson because there will be uh, Bible verses that we can go to. And if we have problems, which we all have problems understanding things, uh, then we can go to Pastor Wyatt and have get his help. Um, and we did, and he's been very helpful. He's been, he's spent a lot of time with Don. I want to thank him for that. And uh, Susie and Jenny and the 
church has been very friendly and helpful. And I want to thank everyone else Amen. because <laughs> I needed all the help I could get. So, so let me ask you, do, have you, had you ever given Bible studies before? No. So Brenda had not given Bible studies before. And had you ever graduated from the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guide? Yes, yes. You had in the past. So you were a little familiar with them, so that's good, right? But it had, how long had it been since you studied uh, those? About ones? 11 years. Okay. There's a story behind that, but I don't want to go into that right now. <laughs> All right. So she didn't have any experience doing Bible studies with someone, but it was as simple as someone was asking her questions. She said, well, let's just go over these lessons together. And you know what? She, I'm sure... Did you learn a lot and get refreshed oh, on was, everything? Yes, my faith has been renewed and it's wonderful. I mean, it's really, it was really great to have someone to study with because, you know, I lived by myself and, and at work I was always asking everybody, would you like to come to church with me? And she, when she said yes, I thought it would <laughs> fall, you know, I thought it would drop. So, the, so perseverance, <laughs> keep asking people right, to come right. and join you for church because someone might just say yes and you might just get... Yeah, and then you I might got. just be really blessed because not only was she able to help someone else to come and go deeper with God and deeper with the Bible, but she was also blessed by doing those. And she had she had no experience doing them. She may have gone over them before. Um, and you know, Donna here, our sister, she is preparing for baptism and is going to join the church here. She's already part of the family, right? And so I want to ask you, Donna, what was kind of some of the bigger influences that kind of made you decide to join the church here and, and get baptized? Well, it started with me asking a bunch of questions, and I, and I got answers to a couple of questions that I've had for years, and then Brenda dragged me on the We came together, and uh, she was really, really helpful. I asked her questions about the questions and a couple of times, uh, but she she was good. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and coming and those amazing facts, they're really helpful. Amen. They it makes you go deeper. And if you don't know the answers to the questions, it makes you go deeper in your own personal studies. Or ask somebody. Or ask somebody. <laughs> you know. And so I want to encourage each of you. So Brenda, one, one last question. question. Um, what, what was you? How would you encourage, encourage those who are maybe afraid of giving five studies? studies? No, do you have any encouragement for them? Well, like I said, um, there are questions that people ask in the beginning of the Bible class. You might say something like, uh, you know, we have a Bible study, and they're very good. They always teach the scriptures in the Bible. And that's what I did with Donna, and I guess uh, my biggest fear was answering questions, and you know, that was my way of saying, well, and if you still don't understand or you have more questions, you can write them down and you can ask her by it. <laughs> yes. So we don't need to be afraid. You know, we don't have to know everything about the Bible before we give Bible studies. So I want to encourage you um, again to. Thank you for those who already did. There are several of you who checked. I want to be trained in giving Bible studies. I'm interested in giving Bible studies. But also you can take out this card if you would like to actually sign up for the Bible studies. Um, you can see there's kids' Bible studies also. And Susie is going to be at the, the um, door with all of our variety of lessons. If you would like to start them, all you have to do is go to her and choose which one you want. And you don't have to do it with anyone right now. Right now, start the Bible study guides yourself so that you, you're kind of already training yourself when you do them yourself. And I'm going to read these two questions. And we are going to have a graduation next month. For those, there are several who have graduated from some of our Bible lessons. And if you're close to finishing, go ahead and finish up. But we're going to have uh, opportunities for graduation on those. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. Revelation 22, 17. Everyone who hears is to repeat the invitation. Whatever one's calling in life, his first interest should be to win souls for Christ. And that's found in Desire of Ages, page 822. And you must respect your own faith in order to successful, successfully introduce it to others. And a great way to respect your faith and to know it is to just go over those studies. So I encourage you, fill out the car or take a study guide and turn it into Susie and start that Bible school. 
God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, for that. That's what we're all about, isn't it? Okay, as we enter into our worship service now, the worship service proper, I have something to share with you. There was a time when Israel, God's people, were facing some very difficult times. The world situation around them. Things were bad and looking worse. Prospects were looking bleak. And at that time, God sent a message to his people through the prophet Isaiah. And I'd like to share it with you now because I really think it applies to our day. Listen. Listen to me, you who know righteousness. You people in whose heart is my law. Do not fear the reproach of me nor be afraid of their insects. For the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look on the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish away like smoke, the earth will grow old like a garment. And those who dwell in it will die in my name. But my salvation will be forever. And my righteousness will not be abolished. Amen. Amen. Let's praise the Lord now who gives encouragement like that. Let's worship you this morning. Shame and fashion us, 
in your likeness, and the light of Christ might be saved today. In your acts of love and your deeds of desire to be fed by your word, we ask and expect your blessed blessing. In Jesus' name. It is now time for our worship and giving, and I would like to tell you about a man named Abraham. Not the Abraham that you read about in the Bible, but he's a man who's living today. He belongs to the Messiah ethnic group, tribe, and they live in Kenya and northern Tanzania in Africa. Abraham is a well to do man. He's the owner of about a thousand head of cattle and large herds of sheep and goats. Acknowledging that God was the source of his blessing, he decided to be faithful to God. He placed his cattle in large pens and counted them as they walked through a shoot. Every tenth cow Abraham dedicated as tithe for God. His friends and acquaintances were amazed. In their culture, wealth is made, people's wealth is measured in cattle. And one, one doesn't just give away his cows. They began to mock him. And many people declared him to be crazy. But several months later, the laughter abruptly stopped when 40 of his cows gave birth to twins. And many of his goats and sheep birthed triplets. You know, 1 Chronicles 29, 14 says, But who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? 
Everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your hand. You know, as we are faithful in our tithes and offerings, God does bless, doesn't he? How many of you have experienced God's blessings? Look at the hands. Wonderful. Well, I just want to mention, as we always do, that you can either give online or we have an offering to table in your life. And so let us pray now to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we do indeed only return to you what you have given us. It belonged to you in the first place, and you have designed ties and offerings to simply be a reminder of that fact. Father, we just thank you for the privilege of that. I pray this in Jesus' name. Sorry, I forgot to invite the children up. Come up now for your story. Yes, sir. Hello. Welcome. Well, howdy, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. I am so glad that you are in God's house today. But I've got a question to ask you. How many of you know, knew how to get to church today, even if, you, if your parents weren't driving? You, knew, you would know how to get here if you were driving. Would you know how? Let me see your hands. You guys, you all be able to get here. You know the way, you know which turns to make. How about going home today? If you went home today and you're going to, you, you would know before you even, your parents even got to the stoplight, which way to turn. You know, you know how to get home? Yeah, probably. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, we're planning on this afternoon for those who are able to, uh, to go out to, we're going to a park. It's called uh, Indian Creek Trail. And we're going to go in nature and walk how many of you know how to get to indian creek trail can you guys get there you could get there like you just you say dad turn left and he would go left and you you'd eventually find your way to indian creek trail you can drive yeah yeah you got a chrysler nice nice give me a lift sometime so if you know how to get, so you may not know exactly how to get to Indian Creek Trail, right? I mean, you have to get, please go there a couple times to get used to the path. Well, I'm going to tell you about a lady named Jane. Jane was on her way and she was driving along and she had the music on in her car. She was just singing away. She just liked to sing, sing, sing. And as Jane was rolling down the road, all this, and she was just taking turn after turn because she knew how to get home, right? Well, she forgot she wasn't going home. She had another errand to run first. And so when she turned left, she realized it was a little bit late. She realized, I was supposed to turn right. Have your parents ever made a wrong turn before? Yeah, please tell me. I'm interested. Oh. Yeah, well, that's. Your dad did that? Well, I tell you what, even you, I'm sure your dad's a great driver, but even the best drivers sometimes take a left when they're supposed to go right. So we'll give him a pass on that one. But you know what Jane did? When she finally realized, like, oh no, I took her left and I was supposed to take her right. She stopped the car. She went and turned around and she got on the right path. Was well, that a good thing to do? If you take the wrong turn, it's better to get back on the right turn, right? Get, just turn around and get going the right way. So she's going down the road, and she's like, all right, I'm on the right path now. She gets back to singing, and she gets a little distracted again. And she realized, without thinking about it, she took the wrong turn again. Now, at this point, what kind of advice would you give to Miss Jane? I heard somebody out there say it. What would you say if she keeps taking wrong turns? What would be a good piece of advice? Get a teacher, Lord, te teach them how to drive. That would be a good idea. Any other suggestions? 
Well, there's something out there called a GPS. And a GPS is designed to help you stay on the right path, right? So she said, oh, I'm going to get out my GPS, and I'm, and I'm going to pay attention now so I don't make any more wrong turns. Now, as she was thinking about it, she started thinking to herself, you know what? Life is kind of like that. You can make the wrong turns if you're not paying close attention to the map. And, you know, I believe that God has given us a GPS. You know what I think GPS should stand for? God's plan in Scripture. God's plan in Scripture. GPS, you guys get it? And this book is God's roadmap. So if you end up finding yourself going down the wrong road, right, how do you know you're on the wrong road? Anybody? Yet if your map is telling you on the wrong road, this is our map, right? This is our GPS. This is God's plan. So what we want to do is pay close attention to the Bible. So it tells us what road to be on, the right road. Is that right? And if we find ourselves on the wrong road, what are we going to do? What did Jane do when she found herself on the wrong road? She stopped and she turned around. There's a Bible word for that. You know what that Bible word is? It's the word repentance. Can you guys say the word repentance? Can you guys say the word repentance? It's a little better. Repentance means to turn around. And you know the Bible will help us do that. Did you know that? And so every time you get going the wrong direction in life, remember God has given you a GPS that you can look at every single day to help you stay on the right road. Does that sound nice? Does anybody want to what? Go ahead, brother. And she says, <laughs> okay, well, I, Grandma's saying not right now, but I tell you what. Would you like to have a prayer? Would you have a prayer for us? No? We're going to hear the story. Is this another dad story? Well, not another dad, but it's another story. Well, yes, you know, with, when you get stuck in traffic, you know, it's actually important to look at that GPS sometimes. It can tell you the quickest way to get out of traffic. All right, guys, would anybody be willing to close in prayer and ask God to help us to stay focused on his word? Anybody want to volunteer? Anybody? Anybody at all? All right, Purity, come over here. Do you want to volunteer anymore? Seriously, come here, baby. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are here with us and help us to have a nice day today. And help us to have good service and help us to have a good day and help us to have a good time. And help us to have a good All right, you guys can go quietly back to your seats. Thank you. hearts for prayer, let us quietly invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us on a personal level. He's a personal God, and He loves us all individually. And I know He looks after us individually. Just this morning, Pastor, on my way to church, couldn't find my keys. Searched and searched. I don't know where my son Shannon is. He probably doesn't want to hear this. So where do I find my keys? I open the car door and they're sitting on the seat all night. Is he a personal God? He is. And he'll cause the thieves to turn the other way. And I know he looks at me. That's just many of the key stories, how he's watched over me. And so I, I wanted to, if I could just briefly tell you that back to God being a personal God. And we, he sends us reminders to, to see if we're witnessing. So on my job this week, I couldn't find something for a customer. And one of my um, coworkers came to me 
and he went to help the customer. I was wondering what took him so long to get back, but he came back to me and said, yes, he wanted, he wanted to give me a son. He told me Jesus is coming back soon. And I thought, oh, he's the wrong one to say that to. But I should have been the one to, be in, to, to tell him Jesus is coming back soon. I said, what are you going to do with that? And he said, well, I went to church as a child, as a kid. I, I, I left home at 16. I said, then what? He said, well, I, I, I wanted a church, but they're all Catholic. I can't find a church. So I said, well, why don't you try to Jenny? Why don't you try a Bible study? Let's, because you got to invite people to the Lord before you invite them to the church sometimes. So I did. I invited him to go to the Amazing Facts site, and he was overwhelmed with that. And I'm so thankful that God is still sending me the things I need to do. Remember to always invite somebody else to the Lord, not just yourself, but he is a personal God. And I'm praying that the Lord will use me with this, with this person this week. And my sister and her... Her daughter, if she's going to do this study as well. I read this this morning. Prayer is the life of the soul. Family prayer, public prayer have their place. But it is secret communion with God that sustains the soul life. Isn't that right? So as you're thinking of things that you want to ask God to do for you this week, with your family members, with those in your neighborhood. Oh, the list can go on and on. But we serve a God that can hear and answer each and every prayer. So if you have a personal request, something that is burdening you, just lift your hands with no shame in the air. God will hear that prayer request. And I don't have to remember. I can see, but God will remember and answer. If you feel a need to come forward, if you're just going to kneel where you are, and please forgive me. Last week, I turned a year older, thankfully. But guess what? I have a couple more aches and pains, so I'm going to sit down. But please, let us reverently pray and kneel in prayer at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we again know exactly who to call. Them. We thank you, Lord, because this morning you chose to wake us up and give us another breath to take. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings, even though we're unworthy, but you still bestow them in spite of our condition. Help us, Lord, to give every need and every prayer, every concern and every burden. We lay down and jerk at this time of it. We just pray that you would just be with us in the midst of our homes, for our children and our grandchildren, for our brothers and our sisters. Those, Lord, that we may have seen two days ago and not, not here today, just last Sabbath, to the friend that I saw last Sabbath that had a massive heart attack five days ago. I pray for the remaining room. I pray, Lord, before it's too late that you would give us the strength just to let somebody know there is hope in the name of Jesus. Be with us this Sabbath day, Lord. Help us and forgive us of our sin, even the secret sins, Lord, that we fail not to bring to your heart. Help us, Lord, because we know time is running out. We see the signs, Lord, each and every day. But again, there is hope in the name of Jesus. Help us the Sabbath through the pastor, Lord, as he brings the words to give us encouragement and strength to make it another day. Help us, Lord, we pray. Help us to love one another. And we just thank you, Lord, for being a mighty God and a mighty creator. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let every lamp be burning bright, the darkest hour is nearing, the darkest hour of this long night before the Lord's appearing. Then trim your lamps, my brethren dear, then trim your lamps with godly fear. The Master's coming, draw it near, let every lamp be burning. Though thousands calmly slumber on the last great message burning, we'll rest our living faith upon this promise of returning. Then trim your lamps, my brethren dear, then trim your lamps with godly fear. The Master's coming draweth near, let every lamp be burning. His word our lamp, His truth our guide, we cannot be mistaken. Though dangers rise on every side, we shall not be forsaken. Then trim your lamps, my brethren dear, then trim your lamps with godly fear. The Master's coming draweth near, let every lamp be Every lamp be burning. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Happy Sabbath, everyone, and welcome to the house of the living God. I am so glad to be here, and I'm glad to see some new faces, and I was about to say old faces, but your face isn't that old. Faces I recognize from before, and uh, I want to just say I'm just so happy to see your smiling faces. You guys got some beautiful smiles. Uh, for those I can't see your smiles, but you're watching online, welcome just the same. We're glad you've chosen to join us today. As you can see, my sermon title today is called Fleeing from Fables. Fleeing from Fables. That's only half the equation. I'll talk about the other half at the end of my message here. And uh, if you haven't yet, my wife pointed out earlier the... A volunteer card, but also we have the connection card. So if you're new here today, uh, you'd like to fill out this connection card just to say who you are. We'd love to stay in touch with you. Maybe a nice card saying thanks for coming. Um, 
but we just are glad you're here. Before I get into my my message, my that the Lord has burdened my heart with, and I just want to share it right now. I want to share the whole thing in this moment. But before I share this message, I need prayer. And I appreciate all the prayer that is a house of prayer, as I mentioned earlier. We all need prayer, amen? But right now, as I pray, um, I'd like to ask you to pray with me. I'm actually going to bow and, and, and pray silently. But as I do so, would you also pray in your hearts and minds to the Lord? Let me ask, are there any truth seekers here in church today? Any truth seekers here? Ooh, I see some hands going up. But, you know, even for those of you who did not raise your hands because, I don't know, you're modest, uh, maybe I'd ask if anybody never raises their hands, maybe then you would raise your hand. But I just, the fact that you are here today worshiping the creator of heaven and earth, you're here today, you've got your Bibles, and you're going to need your Bibles today. We're going to be in the scriptures a lot. The fact that you're here shows me that you are a truth seeker. And I praise God for all of those who have diligently put aside the cares of the world, the burdens of their life, the the distractions, and have searched the Scriptures to discover what is truth and what that truth can do to you to help you personally draw closer to Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, the truth shall set you free. But the, the reality is, and this is a sad reality that we live in a world of lies it's a world of lies and as bad as you know it is it's even worse than that josh mcdowell um let me try clicking here again josh mcdowell he uh he tells about a conversation he had with a just a young lady her name was amber she was 16 years old she was a a Christian from a from a youth group that it was uh, there, and, and he was talking with Amber, and um, she said, or he asked, is, is it wrong, this is what Josh Dell asked the youth group, and she's the one who answered, is it wrong to engage in premarital sex? She said, well, I believe it's wrong for me. Josh says, but if you believe that the Bible teaches that premarital sex is wrong for uh, do you believe that it's wrong for everyone or just for you? Well, she kind of shifted back and forth as he tells the story. Well, it's wrong. I know it's wrong for me, but I have chosen not, personally, I've chosen not to have sex until marriage, but I don't think I can judge other people on what they do. Okay? Why am I talking about this? In her mind, truth is relative. It's true for me, but it may not be for you. And that's okay. Have you not heard similar sentiments in this day and age? Have you not seen this same thing come up time and again? Yo, I choose not to do this. It's my choice. But you have your choice, and you can do your own thing. If that's right for you, great. This is what's right for me. And this is what most people believe in today. He concluded, this is one of his books, he said he concluded that Amber had been conditioned to believe that truth is not true for them unless they choose to believe it. Now, right now, for some reason my clicker is not working this morning. Um, the focus has to be on the screen there. Let's see if I can get it working. Hmm. Not sure what's going on. Well, I just give you the indication. You just hit the next one, okay? Thanks, guys. So he concluded that he be condi- or I just mentioned that. So 80% of Christian young people, he said, all truth is relative to the individual in his or her circumstances. That's what they all agreed to. 80%. This isn't the world. This is Christians, young people who are raised up in various churches in, in our country. They've, been, they've come to believe that truth is relative. Now, the alternative of relative truth is absolute truth. Absolute truth is believing that there is something out there, whether you know it or not, there is something out there that is absolutely right. 
and that everything is going to be measured based on that. Not that truth is some kind of fickle thing, you have yours, I have mine. Why is it that so few people believe in absolute truth? 75% of adults said truth is always relative to the person and their situation. Of teens, 83% said moral truth depends on the circumstances. Again, are you seeing these numbers? Does this not concern you just a little bit that in the minds of most people, they, what, what is right and what's wrong depends on the situation? Maybe like this. It's wrong to steal. Unless you're poor and you can't afford anything, then it's okay. See how the situation, in some of those minds, the situation changes whether it's right or wrong. Now the Bible says, by the way, even when the poor person steals, it's still wrong. Because stealing is always wrong. We know that because we believe in absolute truth. We, we, we define that, of course, by the Ten Commandments. We, we define it by God's Word. We define it by God Himself, Jesus. There is an absolute standard of truth. But that's not the way the world sees it. And that principle, that teaching, that idea is coming into the church. Next slide. Only 6% of teens said that moral, moral truth is absolute. 6%. Now, I hope that is none of our teens, none of our kids, but I hope all of us see that right is right and wrong is wrong always at all times. And so, but this is the idea. This is why we come, we're in a generation today where people get this feeling of, you know, uh, if it feels good, do it. You've heard that before? Everyone else is doing it. As long as it's not hurting anybody else, it's okay. Well, this has been carried over into Bible teachings. And even Christians in the church have this idea about doctrine. When I say doctrine, I'm talking about um, beliefs. The word doctrine simply means teachings. And then they get this idea that, you know what? You have your teaching, I have my teaching. You have your truth, I have my truth. Not, not in a moral sense, right? But in a sense of, of, of correctness of doctrine. This is where I think that the root of, and I'm not here trying to pick on anybody, but this idea of non-denominationalism. That really what we believe is not that important. That you have yours, I have mine, and let's just all get along. And there's this ecumenical movement that's happening, and it's, I mean, I'm telling you, it is, it is so persuasive because it looks so good. It's just like kumbaya, love everyone. Let's just all get along. Let's just set aside our differences and just, just give each other a big spiritual hug. That's what the Pope had said at one time. A big spiritual hug. We're not that different after all. Despite the reality that there's major, huge chasms between what's true and what's false. And friends, we've got to be so very careful in this day and age that we believe what is true. That we must examine our doctrines and evaluate uh, um, what is truth. And I'm telling you, this is, this is, there's power in deception. And there will be people who will be lost simply because they believed a lie. We're going to see some scriptures about that here in just a moment. Next slide, Abraham Lincoln asked an audience one time, a really interesting question. He said, how many legs does a dog have? You may be familiar with this kind of famous story. The audience echoed back, four. Of course, of course. That's right. Now, you suppose you call the dog's tail a leg. Now how many legs does the dog have? And everybody chorused back, five. He smiled and shook his head and he said, no. Calling a dog's tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. You could call it a leg, it doesn't change reality. And we're living in a generation where somebody can consider themselves something that they're not, and you must accept it or you're a bigot. Let me make it clear. Absolute truth does not change. Not based on circumstances, not based on feeling. Truth will always be true. Right will always be right. Now, it's my conviction that, you can go to the next slide, that the root of the sin problem is wrapped up in deception. Think about it. 
Why was Lucifer cast out of heaven? Give me, give me the one word answer. Pride. No. Pride. But what is pride? See, here's the thing. That's going back to what pride is. Pride is me telling myself a lie. Thinking that I'm better than I am. That's what deception is. And so even at the root of his pride problem was a deception problem. He believed a lie. Pride kept him from admitting that he was wrong. Pride kept him from apologizing. Pride kept him from seeing anything other than himself. <clears throat> so what did Lucifer do? He spread the lies. Look at what John 8, verse 44 and 45 says. It says, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Not a little bit. There's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. And Jesus says, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. The reason they didn't believe me because they were of their father, the devil, which was the father of lies. So at the very root of Satan's fall, his, 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 his deviance from God was, that, was deception, self deception in his case. I want you to think about some various synonyms to what a lie is. Now, we're going to look at some of these in the scriptures today. But you've got fables, myths, tall tales, fairy tales, prevarications, fabrications, untruths, white lies, falsehoods, deceit, deception. All these are various terms referring to the same thing of a lie. And we're all tempted, friends, day in and day out, to believe lies. Lies about ourselves, lies about others, lies about reality, lies about God. That's what, In fact, in this great controversy between good and evil, the battle really is about understanding who God is. And Satan is out there lying about God. And it is our privilege as Christians, as believers in the Bible, as, 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 as fellow evangelists and workers of the gospel, it is our privilege, friends, every single one of us, it's our privilege to correct those lies and point people to who? Jesus, who is what? The way, the truth, and the life. To point people to truth. The truth as it is in Jesus. That's our job. That's our mission. That's our goal is to take the, the, the defamation against God's character and straighten it out. Help people see the true and living God, that He is a God of love and of mercy and of grace and compassion and also a God of justice and fairness. This is the God we serve. And so we need to help people understand who this God is. And because I, I'm telling you, to know Him is to love Him. You want to win people to Jesus? Help remove the cobwebs of error from people's minds and put it in a place, these gems of truth, and they will see God in the right conception. They will understand who the true God is and their hearts will be warmed. Their hearts will be converted just by seeing the truth about God. Is error dangerous? Is my next question. Is error dangerous? Think about it. If we have a, think we have a full tank of gas, Go to the next slide. If we think we have a full tank of gas and we don't, is that going to be a problem? <laughs> yeah, you find yourself walking, right? <laughs> Having to buy a gas can just to put in a little bit of gas. I tell you, I'm speaking from experience. Thinking we don't have cancer when we do, can that be dangerous? Thinking we're saved when we're not. Thinking we're in the right church, but we're not. Thinking we're in the right job, the right calling, the right city. Virtually anything, if we think we're in the right place, doing the right thing, but we're actually not, that is so dangerous. It's called denial. It's deadly. In, in, mo in many cases, it can be eternally deadly. We need to pray the prayer of David. Here in Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Oh, guys, this takes humility to pray this prayer. This takes boldness to pray this prayer. Search me, oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxiety and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You know why a lot of people don't want to pray this prayer? 
You're afraid to find out that there is something there. And they're going to have to deal with it. But a true truth seeker, an honest truth seeker, will pray this prayer in all sincerity. And if you find something, it takes humility to admit you're wrong. And few find it. I have a quote here I want to share. This is from Review and Herald, December 2019, sorry, 1892. There's no excuse for anyone in taking the position that there's no more truth to be revealed and that all our expositions of Scripture are without error. The fact that certain doctrines have been held as truth for many years by our people is not proof that our ideas are infallible. Age will not make error into truth, and truth can afford to be fair. Watch this, guys. No true doctrine will lose anything by close investigation. Isn't that powerful? I mean, first of all, how arrogant is it to think that everything I believe and know is right? And yet most of us actually believe that. And it may be true that most of the things you believe is right. But that attitude will keep us from growing. That attitude will keep us from investigating things that, you know what? I've always believed that way. I'm not going to change my belief. When in reality, God wants you to come up higher. He wants you to see it from another angle. He, and, just, I'm not, and I'm not saying that you're wrong. If you try to come up here and convince me that Jesus was not born of a virgin, my ears are closed. La, 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 la. I'm not listening to you. Because I'm, you know, it's like, here's my theory. Until you know something, keep your mind open. The more you study, the more you research, the more you understand, the more you study, the more you get in God's Word. See how it's getting more narrow? People call me narrow-minded. They think, they think about certain things, right? Because I, I don't want to be open-minded about everything. That just I believe anything. But what's the old saying? If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. It's true. We've got to search the scriptures to know what is truth. But once we've discovered what truth is, don't keep your ears open for just any foolishness out there to come wafting in. We've got to be careful. But let's always keep just an option open to reevaluate when I say I appreciate Brother Woody. He is a deep thinker. And he has more than once or twice caused me to say, you know what? I'm gonna especially about prophecy. You know, he's really into prophecy. And I said, you know, I'm gonna have to give that some more thought. I thought I kind of had a clear thought about that, but now you've kind of made me think again. Well, amen, right? We should never come to the place where we're like so close minded that we won't even consider anything else. At the end of the day, though, when we do consider something, we must be making sure that it's coming from God's holy word. What I want to do is take you through a series of scriptures. And as we go through these scriptures, get your, get your Bibles. We're going to be in our Bibles here for just a little bit. Most of them are in the T section of your Bible. You know where your T section is? That's your first, second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, and Titus. That's all kind of in that section there. We're actually going to start in 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Open your Bibles up. I'm reading from the New King James translation. If you've got a different one, try your best to follow along. 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. And, and as we read through this, I'm asking you to let the Holy Spirit do what He does. Bring conviction. Speak to you. Bring revelation to you. Let the Holy Spirit reveal to you some lesson that you can garner today, okay? So, 1 Timothy, beginning in chapter 1, or chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. This is Paul writing to Timothy, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, nor give heed to what? Fables. That's what I'm talking about, fleeing from fables. That's my sermon title today. Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm not bad to be a teacher of the law, but they had no clue what they were trying to teach. Skip over now to chapter 4, same book, 1 Timothy chapter 4, looking in verse 6. Again, this is 
Remember, Timothy was a young pastor, and, and Paul is giving him good pastoral advice. Here in verse five, 6, he says, If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. Here he mentions fables again. I remember when I was a baby Christian. I can't. I mean, I'm, I wasn't a Christian maybe two, maybe three years. And I remember a, a, a fellow Christian that I highly respected. He said, "Don't worry about doctrine. Doctrines of, you know what? We, we just need to be focusing on Jesus, not doctrine." Now I had read the Bible through, and I, I didn't really comprehend it. But I saw it later on. Do you know how much the Bible lifts up good and pure doctrine? It's all through there, saturated. The Scripture is saturated with good doctrine, good teachings. But he was teaching me that the word doctrine is a bad word. Friends, we all have beliefs. We all have things we we have confidence in that we believe is true or not, is not true. It matters what we believe. You say you believe, you know, all we need to do is believe in Jesus. Friends, everything we believe about Jesus is a doctrine. Do you believe he was born of a virgin, as I mentioned earlier? That's a doctrine. Do you believe he lived a sinless life? perfect life that's a doctrine you believe he is our high priest today in heaven that is a doctrine you believe his atonement on the cross was enough for my sins that's it everything goes back to doctrine it's not a bad thing in fact he's telling timothy go and teach this pure doctrine so skip over real quick and this is going to be very interesting second timothy so right over to the next book second timothy chapter four chapter four Beginning in verse 1. This is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Paul writes, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, he tells Timothy. Be ready in season and out of season. Watch this now. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine because they, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn away from the truth and be turned aside to what? To fables. But you be, be watchful in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry, he goes on to say. Wow. He's concerned, Paul's concerned about all the people that are listening to the wrong voices, that are turning away from the truth and turning to fables, turning to fairy tales, turning to lies and deceptions. Turn one more book over, Titus. Titus chapter 1. You can see Paul had a big burden, a big concern on his heart. That truth would be spoken and that error would not be heeded. Titus chapter 1, looking in verse 10. Titus 1, verse 10. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, talking about the Jewish converts, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they, be, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables. You hear that? Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. I got one more I want to share. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. Uh, in fact, I'll just read it here for my notes. It says, for we have not followed, I think it's on the screen as well. This is 2 Timothy 1, 16. For we have not followed cunningly, devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Has anybody ever read Aesop's fables? All right, several of you? Yeah, I mean, if you went to public school, that was part of your curriculum. You learned Aesop's fables. And, a lot of, and by the way, there's a lot of good Aesop's fables in my opinion. I've, I've just, in fact, like two or three just popped in my mind just thinking about it. It teaches some good moral lessons. Of course, a lot of foolishness as well. But a fable is just a story that's made up. It's not true. And you know what? There may be a time when 
a parable or a fable may teach a, a moral lesson and you could get something good from it. But let me just say this. When it comes to what we teach as doctrine, we cannot afford to believe and teach a fable. What we believe and teach. This is why truth is so important to this movement. What, the, what we teach is free from error. And that we aim for that. I'm not saying that we'll, we'll arrive there perfectly. We, we're going to be learning even when we get to heaven. I'm not saying that we're going to arrive at full and perfect truth while we're here. I am saying that we should ever strive for it. We should, we should never tolerate error coming into our ranks. Fables and myths and lies. The people would rather believe in the truth. We're warned, we, we were warned about these fables in the Bible. <clears throat> we just read them. We're told not to listen, not to heed these fables. We're also warned in this next passage about Satan being transformed as an angel of light. Look at this. But what I do, he says in 2 Corinthians 11, but what I do, I also continue to do that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as you are, just as we are in the things which they boast. Now, for such are false apostles. Now, how many apostles did Jesus have? He had 12. How many of them were false? We had one of them that were false, right? That he eventually ended up taking care of himself in a very bad way, but they went and picked another apostle. And later on, there was even more apostles. Paul was an apostle. Barnabas was an apostle. And there may have been others. But here's the thing. You move forward, and what do you find? False apostles arising. Claiming to be teachers. Claiming to be truth bearers. But such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Watch this, guys. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to the works. Now, throughout history, I'm not sure there's been a lot of times where Satan has transformed himself into an angel of light. To deceive masses. We know that's going to come. We're going to see Satan impersonating Jesus in the near future, okay? But watch this. What most people have experienced in this world since the time of Jesus and before that even on to now to the end is what? Ministers transforming themselves. Ministers transforming themselves into ministers of righteousness, but they were but they're really not. They're not ministers of righteousness. We've got to take heed. We've got to be careful. The story is told. A terrible story, not a factual one. One of those that designed to illustrate a truth. But once the devil was walking along with one of his cohorts and they saw a man ahead of them pick up something shiny. What did he find? Asked the cohort. The devil says, a piece of the truth. Well, doesn't it bother you that this man found a piece of the truth? Asked the cohort. No, so the devil, I will see to it that he makes a religion out of it. It illustrates the point that some people could take truth. They even make a religion out of that truth, but miss Jesus. Right? We want not just a piece of the truth. We want all of it. Friends, we must make sure the truth is not taken out of context and twisted. Because that's what is the basis of many false religions. Now here's the question. How do we protect ourselves? Well, just a couple thoughts. We can guard what we listen to. Um, the number one reason in my estimation that uh, homosexuality, and LGBT, all, all that's considered normal is because people have been brainwashed by Hollywood. That's not a bold statement to make. I mean, that's just reality. If you have a little bit of common sense, you know that that is the, but the truth is. People watch and listen to media in such a way that has normalized deviant, sinful behavior to the point to where our society says, well, that's just normal. In fact, it's even gone so far to the other direction to where not only is it considered normal, but if you speak against it, as I said earlier, you're called a bigot. That's where we're at in society today. We've got to be careful what we listen to. We don't want to be brainwashed, right? The reason a lot of people believe in the lies of scientists who are atheists, right? Is because it's it's ever it's in all the textbooks, 
By the way, not all scientists are atheists, by the way. But there, but there is a, a concerted effort in this world by people with outstanding degrees in the scientific fields to disprove the existence of God. It's like they're purposing life is to prove that God doesn't exist. And so they've come up with all these theories and ideas and, and so-called evidences to try to prove it. Now the Bible will call it, Peter calls it, science falsely so-called. True science is the evaluation of that which is observable. What they're doing is trying to come up with these theories and ideas, theory of evolution being my prime example, that if you believe it, you can't believe in a God. They don't they don't they cannot coexist. No Christians will try to coexist those two things. But the but, they, but, but it's everywhere. You can you can't even watch a nice documentary about African animals out in the Sahara or about the jungles of South America. You can't you know learn just in everything 3.2 million years ago. Everything has been so corrupted with, 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 with these lies of Satan, and we hear it so often, we wonder why our kids grow up you know, disbelieving in God, it's because error after error after error has been sown into their ears. And what do we do? Once a week we take them to church to hear the opposite, and then all week long they're educated one way, and then maybe at home you praise God if you're having family worship. How do we know it's true? Friends, we've got to make sure we're not listening constantly to lies until we believe that it is true. I, I found this statistic pretty interesting. NASA wants to find planets that would harbor life so bad. Like there, there is a science, there is a a, a a field in our government that is sole purpose is to find life on other planets, discover life on Mars, discover life anywhere but here. Right? They're just like. It's amazing. In fact, they're spending $20 billion a year. So far, we've spent over $500 billion to try to send out spacecrafts and satellites and all these things to try to discover life out there. Because if they can find life out there, to them, that's proof, final evidence that God doesn't exist. That we didn't come... Because you know what? This idea of random, spontaneous creation is something the scientists cannot accept. Or so I said that backwards, I'm sorry. Spontaneous creation is something scientists cannot accept. They believe, right now, the current theory is that random chance created the spark that ended up making the original cells that pull them together, the amino acid, all these different things to create life and form the plant life and animal life. and Total, total chance. That's what they believe in right now. But they realize there's just, there's no evidence of any life ever starting on its own. Never been proven. So a lot of scientists are saying our current theory of evolution just doesn't fit. So they say, well, life had to have started out there somewhere. And they're spending so much money to try to prove it. All they, you know what, I could save them so much money. I could save so much money. I just say, look, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And that solves it right there. You want to look up in the stars in the sky? Do it. Get out your telescopes. But all of that is to bring glory to God. Not to try to find answers that you don't want to find. Or try to find answers that they want to find. We've got to be careful what our children watch. What they listen to. Music. Even in going to the stores, who they're, what the friends are saying. If there's a teacher or a preacher out there who teaches error, I say don't listen to them. There's no reason to listen to error. You don't. If you know it's error, you, look, you don't have to drink a whole gallon of spoiled milk before you know it's spoiled, right? If you got a little bit of spoiledness, don't touch it. It's done. So there's people out there spewing error left and right. Why do we spend so much time trying to find the trying to find a little bit of you know, um, sometimes I read a book that's not, and you know, the 
perfect book, right? And I say to myself, I'm trying to eat the watermelon but spit out the seeds. The reality is, and that may be the case. You know, there's some things out there that's pretty good. I've read some really good books that's blessed me and has some seeds in it, okay? You don't want to eat the seeds. But if it's mostly seeds and just a little bit of watermelon, why are you doing that to yourself? Why are you doing that to your family? All right, next point. Guard what, or not just guard how, what we listen to, but guard how you listen. Friends, every time you listen to somebody or someone or read a book or whatever, whether you're reading in the news, always filter it through God's Word. I call it the gospel filter. Put your gospel filter on. The Bereans had their gospel filter, right? It says in Acts chapter 17, I believe it's verse 11, that the Bereans, they were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they searched the Scriptures daily, right? Seeing whether these things are so. So they put on the gospel filter to make sure what they were hearing is true. They didn't believe it unless the Bible said it. When you're reading the Bible, you can take your filter off and read the Bible, by the way. It is God's Word. But when you're reading another book or hearing a preacher, even me, put up that filter and make sure that you're listening the right way. Number three here, beware of Satan's tactics. You know, if you're going to be in battle, it's good to know what the other army is doing. If you can figure out what the other general is doing, their plans, their strategy, you could make better preparations in your defense. Is that right? I'm not saying spending a lot of time to study Satan's strategy. I'm saying be aware of his devices. And the Bible actually will warn you about several of those things. Earlier we just read about how he transforms into an angel of light, so we know that not everything that looks right is right. Not everything that looks true is true. Knowing that helps us not be deceived. Look at the story of Jesus and how he met the devil there in the wilderness, right? With those three temptations. That studying, that studying that will help us to better be prepared. Moving on, I want to share about one of the worst kinds of fables. And those are the ones that we tell ourselves. The fables, the lies that we tell ourselves. I would submit to you that most of our problems come today for the lies we tell ourselves. But the worst part about it is that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives to show us the truth about ourselves, right? What did Jesus say when he sends the Holy Spirit? He will convict us of what? Sin, of righteousness, and what else? Judgment. Thank you. You don't have to whisper. You can shout it out. I'm, I'm okay with that. I like the participation. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Do you want, okay, if you're committing a sin, do you want to know about it? Do you want the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you? Oh, amen. You should. Right? Righteousness. If you're doing what's right, don't you want to know that it's right? Amen. The Holy Spirit will convict you. Keep doing it. That's the right thing to do. And of judgment. Making good decisions. The Holy Spirit will give you that discernment between right and wrong. And so, friends, we've got to be careful. Do we really want to know the truth? I mean, we... <laughs> Um, the story is told about Barney. Barney was getting old, and uh, he lo- I mean, he just loved his thick, wavy hair, but the older he got, the more it was falling out. It was here and there. Every time he brushed his hair, the more hair would fall out. So finally, one day, just one lone hair remained on his head. One morning, he woke up. As he was getting out of bed, he looked at his pillow, and there on his pillow was that final strand of hair. He was so shocked. He, he went to his wife. He said, Martha, Martha, I'm bald. You see, we know he'd been bald all along, right? But he would not acknowledge it until that last strand of hair was gone. Friends, we've got to wake up. We can't be deceiving ourselves and thinking that one thing is, is truth when it's not. It's honestly worse. We like our church and we don't want to be wrong. And I'm telling you, that's why most people stay in their churches despite the reality that they know they're worshiping on the wrong day. Despite the reality that, 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 that what they're believing and teaching is contrary to direct scriptures, it's because they don't want to believe it. They would rather be comforted with a lie than to be uncomfortable with the truth. We like our diets. We don't want to change. 
We like our friends. We like our parties. We like our drugs or alcohol or tobacco or whatever it is that we're stuck into. We like it so much that we're not willing to even consider the, the reality that God wants us to change. Some people just like being liked. And that to them is more important than anything else. But the reality is, and, I, and I, again, I, I've, I've studied the Scriptures. I've went through here, and I don't see very often where truth is comfortable. I don't see where... Now, now, look, I know truth will set you free. But that path of freedom is not a comfortable path. And that ultimate freedom that we'll have because of the truth doesn't mean that it's not going to be a struggle to get there. I think about what Jesus said in John chapter 3. John chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. John 3. You guys know how he was meeting with Nicodemus that night. Beginning in verse 19. Listen to the powerful words that Jesus spoke. Verse 19. This is John chapter 3. Verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. So, you know, remember earlier we, we, we quoted very uh, frequently, you know, John 3.16. We get to verse 17. It says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. Right? That's not why Jesus came. He didn't come to condemn anybody, but that the world through Him might be saved. That wasn't the purpose of Jesus coming. wasn't to condemn anybody. But he, that doesn't mean there won't be condemnation. Because 19 says, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But, this is the positive side of it, but he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. I mean, remember earlier we read there in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says they, people were heaping themselves, teachers having what kind of ears? Itching ears. Oh, we want to be people that, that, that seek the light, even if that light makes you uncomfortable. I, I remember my teenage days. Oh boy, I would break out in pimples. Any, uh, anybody can identify with that? Oh wow, so many pimples. And I'd be like popping this one and this one, I was, it was so bad. I get up in the morning and I look in the mirror and I say, "Oh, that's not too bad." And I put the light on. Oh, that light sometimes shows you what you don't want to see. So I went to the store and my dad got me this um, this cleansing pad, right? It's supposed to clean your face so you don't get those pimples anymore. I didn't like putting that on. It was not comfortable trying to deal with the root problem and, and you know I didn't even realize what the root problem was then I was just eating too much fatty foods I was a greaseaholic sometimes we don't want to change but that change is what God wants for us hey guys I'm about to show you something powerful Revelation 22 verses 14 and 15 blessed you guys know this very well this verse is probably memorized it's in your heart praise the Lord I want you to notice verse 15 in just a moment. It says, blessed are those who do his commandments. Now, this, by the way, the context of this is right to the very last days. The context of this is dealing with those who are able to go into God's holy city, the new Jerusalem. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and what? Whoever loves and practices a lie now that right there tells me at the heart of those who are lost is a lack of love for the truth in fact what do they love they love lies and because they love the lie they practice how do you practice a lie by the way the way you practice a lie is by knowing what's wrong but doing it anyway I think a perfect example of that we see in many people, not, not all, but many people today know that the true Sabbath begins at sunset on Friday night and is holy time all the way to sunset on Saturday night. That is holy time. They know this truth in their mind intellectually, biblically. They've seen it. It's true. They can't deny it. They can't fight it. It's just clear as day. Scripture beginning from Genesis all the way to Revelation but they choose not just to believe a lie, right? 
but to practice a lot. And they ignore the Sabbath. They trample it by working on the Sabbath every week, by doing secular things on the Sabbath. They also lift up and exalt another day by attending churches. and, and I just I'm, God has given us truth. And in the end, there's going to be a separation between those who are keeping God's commandments and those who are not keeping God's commandments, between those who love the truth and those who love a lie. And I'm asking you today, this is where I want you to self-reflect, right? Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Self-reflect. Do I love the truth so much that I'm willing to sacrifice anything to obtain it and to do it? Do I love truth that much? Is there anything that was standing between me and the truth? People like to be lied to. I mean, they sit down. I mean, this is the majority of this world. I don't think it's the majority of this church, but it's the majority of this world. They will sit down in front of a television, and they will watch a TV show or a movie in which the entire thing is a lie. Think about it. I'm not trying to be you know, hyperbolic here. Movies that are not true stories are lies. Can't say it any other way. But as we watch the lie on TV, it's an entertaining lie. That lie makes me laugh. Oh, good comedy. Woo! <laughs> Drama. Oh! <laughs> I, 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 I didn't even like watching scary movies when I was, like, when I was in the world. But people like watching scary movies to be scared, even though they know it's not real. They're, and then they don't, it's not real, and you know it's not real, and yet they're still crying. They're still laughing. <sighs> they're still scared. Am I missing one? Action. Oh, the heart starts beating. Even though it's not real. But we, in our minds, tell us that, tell ourselves it's true. People like to be lied to. Is that, is that, you understand that? I'm not saying there isn't some good things out there. I'm just suggesting that all this fake stuff that we enjoy so much until we begin to love lies. And truth all of a sudden isn't as interesting to us anymore. People like to be lied to. Does this dress make me look fat? You better answer correctly. Lie to me if you have to. Right? People like to be lied to. Tell me what I want to hear, not what I need to hear. I'm not saying there's not a tack away without lying. You can still be truthful without getting yourself in trouble, okay? Seek wisdom. People buy clothes they can't afford with money they don't have to please people they don't even like. You've heard that saying before? We need to pause and consider our choices, reason from cause to effect. We must examine ourselves honestly. I like Lamentations chapter 3 uh, and verse... 40, let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. We need to realize if our st heart is stubborn, we need to own up to it. If it's wicked, we need to own up to it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because, and by the way, how do, why did they believe the lying wonders? Why, did they, why were they deceived? Here it is. Here's the, key. Here's the key. Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. What I want you to walk away with here today in this message is that you've got to love truth. And if you don't love truth, you'll be lost. You've got to love truth. Jesus said, seek and you shall find. Right? Are we seeking for truth? Even if it's uncomfortable truth. Jesus says he is the truth. The Bible says in Psalm 119 that the law is truth. John 17, 17, the prayer of Christ, he says, thy word is truth. So God's law, God's word, and Jesus himself is truth. I wanted to explain this to you. Inasmuch as you accept or reject the truth, you're accepting or rejecting Jesus. This is why we've got to take this seriously. Winston Churchill once said, men occasionally stumble over truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing happened. When you open your Bible, you're going to be stumbling, more than stumbling across truth. 
but don't walk off as if nothing happened. Let it change your life. I'm gonna, I wasn't sure I was gonna tell you this story. I know I'm over time, what I wanted to be. I'm gonna tell you a story about, I may have shared it here already, I'm not sure, but I'm gonna share it again. There's a young man on a quest for truth. And he was told that if you climb high in the mountains on a certain range, there's an old wise man there, and he will tell you how to find the truth. The man really wanted to know the truth, so he sought out on his quest. He got his backpack on, went on this arduous journey through the, the, all the woods and the rivers and, the, and, and up the mountains. Finally, he come across the old cabin of this old wise man. The man was in the cabin. He looked around. There was a stream, so he went over to the stream, and there was the old wise man sitting right on the bank of the river, of the stream. And he said, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, yes. I've been told that you and your wisdom, you know how to discover the truth. Please tell me the secret to finding the truth. The old man says to the young man, sir, are you sure you want to find the truth? Oh, I want to find it so bad. I'm desperate. Really, do you really, really, really want to find the truth? And discover it. Yes, sir, more than anything. So said, then come here. The young man stepped over to the, to the edge of the bank there. The old man, as fast as could be, he swept that young man off his feet and into the water. He's about knee deep, and he's got this young man, and he's actually pushing him under the water. He's holding him under the water. And, of course, you can just imagine the young man just flailing his arms, trying to, trying to be released and be free. And, and all the while... The old man is holding him down until finally he lets him out of the water. And he goes, <gasps> the old man says, if you seek for the truth as much as you did for that breath of air, you will find it. Now, I don't know if that, I'm sure that parable wasn't true, but I will say this. How much do we want to know the truth? Do we really love it? Do we really want it? And our will, will, Jesus, remember how he said about righteousness? It's, he said, those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. I think it's the same way with the truth. If you want the truth, you've got to be willing to put everything on the line to find it, to search with all your heart and all your mind, and you will find it, friends. You're going to have, if you have that hunger for truth, you're going to find the right church. You're going to find the right doctrines. You're going to face the facts about your health choices. You're going to get your priorities straight when it comes to your family, your work, your friends, your school. You will find Jesus who is the truth. I'm going to close today with a quote from John Huss. In fact, this is my appeal to you. John Huss had said, listen to the truth, teach the truth, love the truth, abide by the truth, and defend the truth to death. And if you know John Huss's story, you know that he did that very thing, dying for the truth. Friends, I hope, I pray, that all of us will be faithful to the truth to the very end and that you will learn to love it. Let's pray for that very thing just now. Father, we want your truth, unadulterated, unmixed with anything savoring of fables and lies and error, we want Jesus. Oh God, grant us that desire, our request, that we would be so filled with a desire and a hunger for truth that not only will we find Jesus, but it will so overflow our lives that others will see Jesus in us and desire Him too. Help us love the truth. Protect us from deception and error. Help us to guard our ears from what we hear. And help us keep our eyes on your Son, Jesus Christ. For it's in His name I lift up this prayer to you. I'm going to invite the singers to come now. We're going to sing a song. I will, well, maybe it's not that one. It's uh, Open My Eyes That I May See. Come on.
the load when made, Spirit divine. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being the God of the truth. Thank you for being the truth. Father, we want to be a people of the truth. Give us a love for the truth. Help us to love the truth even when it is in and to turn away from it. The Father, you've given us the witness text tonight. You have told us in your word that by this we can know that we are of the truth, that we have love for one another. And I pray that that would be our experience today. Jesus. Sabbath, remember?